WWE Fastlane was pretty much exactly what I expected it to be. A largely forgettable show that is building towards what's going to be, in my estimation, a largely forgettable mania. And it basically was a $10 Raw. If the WWE thought that this was the type of show they needed to put forth during their free trial month in February to entice more people to subscribe to the WWE Network, uh, they are sadly, sadly mistaken. How dare you, WWE? How dare you sit there and stick to your guns? How dare you sit there and deny Daniel Bryan what is so rightfully his? That is a spot at the main event of WrestleMania 31. I don't know how many different times and how many different ways we have to tell you, but he is the most over guy you've got, and he is the best mother of the in the world. What I'm having a hard time understanding is why the WWE feels the need to continue to do 12 pay-per-views a year now that they have the WWE Network. It just doesn't seem necessary. It just doesn't seem like there's a point to it. It seems like it's counterproductive. Like I'm looking at Fastlane, this in no way, shape, or form to me felt like a pay-per-view. Again, it felt like basically a $10 version of Raw. And when you look at the fact that the WWE used the Raw set for yet another pay-per-view, if the WWE isn't going to try, if the WWE isn't going to care enough to put forth more effort, then why should the fans try to put forth more effort to care about these shows? It's, it's that simple to me. Why have 12 of these? This is a pay-per-view that we could have just skipped, frankly. You look at the six-man tag that kicked off Fastlane, and it literally felt like a Raw six-man tag. Like, not even a Raw main event six-man tag. Like a Raw one-hour, two-hour main event six-man tag. This just wasn't that good. This was just clearly thrown together to get to something else. And what I'm really having trouble understanding is, why the hell is Dolph Ziggler jobbing the cane? What the hell type of decision was that? Who thought that this made any fucking sense at all? If Ziggler was going to job, at least have him job to the Money in the Bank winner, the guy that you actually have something big planned for at WrestleMania, you've got Ziggler jobbing to fucking Kane. The only redeeming quality of this, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but it's gotten to that point with the WWE, the only thing that saved this for me, the only thing that I cared about was the return of the Viper, Randy Orton. You know it's a bad time when I'm excited for the return of Randy Orton, but that's exactly what I am. Hello, everyone out there. My name is the Blue Button. I am back once again, just like my hero, Randall Keith Orton. Yay! Yay! Raging ring boners. Baby oil sleeve tattoos and construction worker beards. If I didn't beat my Borton till it's blue, that would seem to be quite weird. Yay! Yay! There were reasons I wanted the WWE to wait for Cody Rhodes or Stardust versus Goldust until WrestleMania. And I saw exactly why I wanted him to wait here at Fastlane. Now, don't get me wrong. I liked this match. And I liked the story that they tried to tell, and I in particular really liked how Stardust was letting the Cody chance get to him, like actually trying to tell a story with the character. I liked this match. It's a shame that the crowd wasn't buying it, but frankly, I can't blame the crowd for not buying it. We really didn't need to do this match now, and even though they had the right guy win in the right way, letting me know more likely than not we will get another match between the two of these guys at WrestleMania, this match should have just been saved for WrestleMania because you blew your load on one of these matches at a forgettable pay-per-view, and this ended up being a forgettable match. Just a little side note here, but Memphis used to be a great wrestling town. I mean, that was the domain of superstar Bill Dundee and Jerry the King Lawler. I mean, Memphis used to be one of those really hot popping territories back in the day. And a town that I thought always loved professional wrestling, one of those places you always wanted to have a big show at every year because this would be a crowd that would understand it. This would be a crowd that gets it. What the fuck happened? WWE, please never, ever have a pay-per-view in Memphis ever again. This is one of the worst pay-per-view crowds I have heard in some time. Like, I can't think of the last time I heard a shittier pay-per-view crowd.
to the Memphis fans that actually paid their money to go to this show. Why are you going to pay your money to go to this show to sit on your fucking hands and largely do nothing? If you are enjoying the show, then let it be known. And if you're not enjoying the show, let it be known by making your voices heard. All this idiotic shit about hijacking shows, we didn't even get that type of effort out of the Memphis crowd. Why should the WWE care if the crowd they're playing to in attendance doesn't seem to give a fuck? That was horrible. So the tag team title match was an okay match, in my mind, with the so-so finish. But it really didn't stand out as being, you know, really pay-per-view worthy. It, again, just felt like so many other things on this show did, like it belonged on a Raw. And, again, this was part of my concern with the WWE Network for the WWE is that with the lack of uh, concern about trying to justify a $50 or $60 price, now they only have to justify a $9.99 price. Uh, they wouldn't have to do as much to give people the type of show t that they needed to in order to justify that price. And throughout this show, you saw this play out. And the tag team title match here was another perfect example. It was a match that just frankly felt like it belonged on a Raw. I know the hardcore fans are happy with Cesaro and Kidd uh, winning the belts, and that's all fine and good. I think it's kind of pointless. I know what some of you are going to say. Well, the, the Usos will win the titles back at Mania. So, again, it makes it even more pointless. But what makes it even seem more pointless to me with Cesaro and Kidd winning it is that I get this creepy suspicion that this is ultimately on the road to WrestleMania going to be more about Naomi and Natalia than it's going to be about the Usos and Cesaro and Kidd. Watch what I tell you. Heading into this pay-per-view, one of the things that I at least gave a little bit of a fuck about was the confrontation between Triple H and Sting. And that was largely just because of the fact that I was going to get to see Sting. It's just what it is. But even in this case, this whole Sting-Triple H confrontation was kind of a swing and a miss to me. It felt like a Raw segment. For Christ's sakes, even Triple H and Sting couldn't pop the Memphis crowd. That's how bad the night was. That's how bad and horrible this Memphis crowd was. You've got Triple H in his three sizes, two short, leather jacket, and Sting and his velour, whatever the fuck jacket that is, with his plastic black baseball bat, and they couldn't even pop the crowd. Like, you've got this big thing happening. You're pointing to this huge WrestleMania feature type of match between Sting and Triple H, and yet the fans there still largely don't care. I can't blame them on that. Because I don't care. I don't care to see Sting versus Triple H at WrestleMania. This is not the match I've waited 15 or 20 years for WWE, no matter how much you try to bullshit us and say otherwise. This was like a secondary or third level match of interest in terms of who I would want to see Sting face if he ever worked in the WWE. You know, this is just one of those ultimate examples of, at the end of the day, the Breakfast Club always gets theirs. Praise God! Well, speaking of things that felt like they belonged on Raw and nothing more, the Divas Championship. Is anybody else still bothered by the fact that this company wasted several months of the summer trying to get you interested in what was going on between Nikki and Brie Bella just to put them back together and not even give you a real solid explanation for this? It's the bottom line is the WWE doesn't care about the Divas. So why should we? These matches should go back to being the officially designated piss slash shit break, even though you probably don't have enough time to take a good shit, so it's just got to be a real solid piss, both for the people watching at home and the people watching live. You know, it's a good time to go to the concession stands, if you will. Again, if the WWE doesn't care, then why should we? And this IC title match most certainly felt like something that belonged on a Raw, something we would see on a Raw. Why would you have Wade Barrett win the Intercontinental Championship just to book him like this? Why does the WWE do this to their mid-card champions? As soon as they give them the belt, then they give them no shine, really, no showcase, no spotlight, and they just have them lose all the damn time because that's going to add prestige to the belt, right? Because that's going to elevate the talent that won the title, right? Holy Christ almighty. And then furthermore, why is Ambrose in this spot? He was a part of one of your more successful factions you've had over the past 10 to 15 years, and you've got him feuding over a meaningless title like the IC belt against a meaningless opponent like Wade Barrett. It, at least I can appreciate that the WWE is trying to have a feud here. It seems like a little bit, and they're trying to do something to give us a little bit of effort like they kind of fucking care, but don't be fooled. They really fucking don't. And I really wish they wouldn't have had this match here at Fastlane, even though I kind of liked 
how they booked the finish with Ambrose. I'm okay with him not always winning. I like the fact that he goes over the edge and cost himself the match sometimes. As soon as I heard the gong, and as soon as I saw the Druids, I knew what was up. I knew what the score was here. I wasn't fooled. I knew what was coming. But with that said, the segment design for this was great. And Bray Wyatt's performance was also very good, if not borderline great. It was. It's a shame, again, that it was wasted at Memphis when they clearly decided early on that they weren't going to give a fuck about any of this. And I don't know at this point if I could even blame them. I'm being honest with you. But at the same point in time, as well as the segment was executed, and as good as Bray Wyatt was, it was still another Raw segment on a pay-per-view. This is the type of shit that you're trying to use to entice people in this free trial month to subscribe long-term to the WWE Network, this isn't going to get the job done. And the whole time as you're sitting there, or at least me, and I'm sitting there watching Bray Wyatt, I'm saying, well, this is a match that's too late where nobody's going to win. If Taker wins, it's stupid. If Wyatt wins, it's stupid. You've taken one of my favorites of all time and pitted him against one of my favorites of the current generation and given me a match that I absolutely do not care to fucking see at all. That takes a special kind of stupid to pull off and accomplish, and that's exactly what the WWE has done. And then we got to the last two matches of the night, and this was what I ultimately cared about on this show. Everything else could have kicked rocks as far as I'm concerned, and pretty much based off of what happened, everything else could have kicked rocks as far as I was concerned. So this U.S. title match between John Cena and Rusev. I give the Memphis crowd credit. Uh, at least they woke up for this one and decided to mostly boo both of them. <laughs> Even the USA versus Russia story wasn't enough to get the crowd behind John Cena. <laughs> but I thought these two had pretty solid in-ring chemistry. I wasn't sure how it was going to work heading in. You know, could have went one way, could have went another. I thought these guys did a pretty good job. For the most part, they told a decent story. You know, Cena had those moments of doing his bullshit but then when he got away from that, I thought this match in a lot of ways did what it needed to do until, of course, as so often is the case with a John Cena match, we got to the finish. This finish could have been so much more. The distraction was unnecessary. The nutshot was unnecessary. Having Cena pass out like that as a result of that distraction and that nutshot was unnecessary. There was a real chance and an opportunity here to tell so much more of a story with John Cena, to do something incredibly interesting with Cena and Rusev and this storyline heading into WrestleMania that even jaded fans could have maybe gotten behind at least just a little bit or at least had some appreciation for, and largely it just ended up becoming more of the same old bullshit. These type of finishes, WWE, don't help the John Cena character. They actually hurt the John Cena character. You're not protecting him. You're exposing him. It's always something. It's always got to be some type of bullshit. Not only did he not tap out where he could have really played off of the never give up by the fact that he actually gave up, but Rusev had to nut shot the guy in order to get him to submit by passing out. Just could have been so much more. I tried to tell all of you it was going to happen. Roman Reigns, once and for all, would prove his superiority over that goat-faced vanilla midget Daniel Bryan. And that's exactly what he did. Oh, Roman, with his hair and those muscles. Oh, my God. I've been telling you for a long time it was bound to happen. And hopefully everybody is accepting the reality that Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 31 will beat Brock Lesnar's stupid sandwich selling ass and become the next WWE World Heavyweight Champion. Love you, Romans. Roman commies. Roman! Love yous. Oh my god, what a hunk. And then we got to what we all felt was going to be the main event, even though uh, some may not have noticed that in that pre-show they talked about Rusev versus Cena was going to be the main event. I was like, whoa, where the fuck did that come from? Uh, but Roman Reigns versus Daniel Bryan was the match that needed to main event this pay-per-view, should have main evented this pay-per-view, and felt like, frankly, the main event to this pay-per-view. For my money, it was the match of the night. And, you know, when I look at this, heading into it, I was wondering, was the WWE going to have the courage to stay the course? Were they going to stay with Roman Reigns? 
or were they going to change course and panic and reflex reaction again and go with Daniel Bryan, or were they going to do the worst thing of all and not choose his side and give us some type of wishy-washy bullshit finish? Let's be honest. That's what a lot of us expected, and at least some credit to the WWE for not doing that. I was also wondering, would Daniel Bryan show who he is? Would Daniel Bryan prove himself as a top guy, but doing what needed to be done here? Well, I'll say this. This match, in my mind, for my money, told the story that it was supposed to do. This was the match that actually felt like a pay-per-view match on this entire card. This was really the only one. Maybe you could say it was Cena Rusev that had a pay-per-view feel to it, and to a degree I would say that. But for sure, the one real quality pay-per-view match that we had here that felt like it should have been a pay-per-view match was Roman Reigns versus Daniel Bryan. This match, again, told the story it was supposed to. You had Bryan's wrestling skills versus Roman Reigns' power. I thought it was a very good showing for Roman Reigns, and mad respect to Daniel Bryan. Mad respect to him. Because he did what he was supposed to do. He didn't just do the job. He did the job the right way. And he did the things necessary on his end to try and get Roman Reigns over the right way. You know, there's a difference between doing a job and really helping to try and get somebody over. And I have a tremendous amount of Daniel respect for Daniel Bryan for doing what was required, for doing what was asked, for doing the right thing. This finish was booked exactly how it should have been, in my opinion. Uh, the problem is, though, is that they've done such a good job, in my opinion, of creating an issue between Roman Reigns and Daniel Bryan, and in particular, giving Daniel Bryan some edge to the point where you start to wonder almost, are they going to turn him heel at some point, that it still leaves me wanting more out of them in a feud right now. Now, maybe you could turn to this later. You could turn Daniel Bryan into the authorities' yes man. And you could do a feud between the two of these guys. And maybe that's what will happen at some point in time. But at this particular moment, whether Daniel Bryan won or whether Roman Reigns won, I had absolutely no interest at this moment of seeing either one of them go against Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania 31 for the title. I'd rather see this story, this feud between Roman Reigns and Daniel Bryan continue in advance. Because I think the dynamics of it work so much better. And since they've already gone away from Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar to set up to this match, I want him to fucking finish off this feud. So if the WWE was viewing this as a real launching point for Roman Reigns and a real opportunity to get the fans behind him heading into WrestleMania 31, taking on Brock Lesnar, uh, I think they failed. Now, I know a lot of you just want to sit there and hate on Triple H, and you want to blame Vince McMahon, and I understand, and who could blame you? However, there are people that deserve more of the blame for what happened here, I assure you. Let's look at the top three enemies to the greatest mother of us in the world, Daniel Bryan. Number three, Summer. What is it about damn animals on this stupid channel that when they get behind somebody, they get pushed to the fucking moon? The moon! The moon! First it was the damn 30-pound gray cat. And now it's a freaking beagle that licks their own butt. This is who the WWE appeals to, people. A dog who licks her own butt. Number two. Gold standard zero, zero, zero. That's right. Zero, zero, zero. Representing the number of people that give a shit about his opinion. Outside of the WWE, of course. Here he is on Twitter talking about, oh, I think Daniel Bryan versus Sheamus would be a great match and it would tell a great story heading into WrestleMania. Shut up! It's because of morons like you that the WWE pulled this shenanigans. It's because of morons like you and marks like you that the WWE committed this atrocity against Daniel Bryan. But the biggest enemy of all to the Yes Movement is the one that comes on here and starts his crying, and then I instantly know that he's lying, because he's a fan of the Hulkster, and not Daniel Bryan, and that is Deluxe Man. Hey, Deluxe Man, it seems like whenever you get behind somebody, they get sabotaged. It seems like whenever you get behind somebody, they get buried. When you get behind somebody, they get deep pushed. So why don't you do us all a favor? Stop your lying, stop your crying, stop pretending to be a Daniel Bryan fan, and go do something for the greater good, and go hop on the Roman Reigns bandwagon. You know you want to, you muscle mark. So why don't you do that, and do us all a favor, and let us real Daniel Bryan fans support the best mother wrestler in the world. So basically, this was just another three-hour Raw, just a $10 version of it. 
I mean, and let's be honest, if the WWE didn't care enough to do better and the Memphis crowd didn't care enough to get involved or interested in the show, why should we, the ones that were sitting at home watching it? I mean, this is how bad this show was in one sense. And it wasn't bad in the sense that I go off like I've done before and will do again, surely, ranting and raving and just outright yelling and screaming. But you get the sense that it was just a general feeling about the show of apathy. You know, you had a finish of Roman Reigns going over Daniel Bryan that you would have thought would have elicited all types of incredibly angry, butthurt responses out of the hardcore Daniel Bryan fans. And even they couldn't be bothered to get that angry. It's like they were resigned to the fate. It's like they don't have the fight. And that was stunning for me to see. I was expecting much more outrage and much more anger to be expressed on social media Sunday night, Monday morning than what we ultimately got. It was, you know, a lot of complaining, but it wasn't that level of anger. It wasn't that level of outrage. It's like the hardcore fans understand. They know and understand that WrestleMania 31 is starting to really get that WrestleMania 27 feeling to it. They know it's what it's going to be, and sadly, they've accepted their fate. And the WWE seems to be accepting their fate.